right. Welcome. Welcome to Drupal Camp London. Um, lovely new facility. I've never seen a lecture theatre set up like this. This is great. Very, very communal. So you've got to try and find somewhere to sit, of course. <laughs> um, right, so uh, I've got a rather, the rather cryptically titled Future of Content and the Unknown Consumer. So this is a talk that I've done a couple of times now, and it's really it's trying to give you a little bit of a, uh, a guide to where we are right now in content management, where we are going to be in the future, and the sort of things that we need to be doing today to prepare ourselves. But first of all, I just want to quickly introduce myself. Those who do know me from the past, I've been in the Drupal community for many, many years, but you probably would have known me from ICOS. Um, since this time last year, ICOS has officially merged with, with Invica uh, to become one, because we used to run as these four separate brands. Um, so this time last year, we were still ICOS and a part of the Invica group, and now we're purely known as Invica. So if you're wondering uh, who Invica are, it's, ICOS is now part of that, that unit. Enough of all that. So, what we want to talk about today is the unpredictability of today's web. We want to talk about the things that are, we are seeing already changing around us and the things that are going to change in the future. So, there's going to be a little bit of future gazing, a little bit of speculation, and a few examples of things. Now, I have to say, from having done this talk before, the examples you hear are not real. They're theoretical. There's no NDAs involved. It's purely theoretical stuff based on examples of businesses out there. I got questioned quite heavily last time I did this uh, to an audience of journalists who thought they'd got a scoop. So just to put that one to bed. <laughs> so today's web. Now I've called this talk The Unknown Consumer. And in order to do that, we need to think about, well, what's the known consumer? So when we think about the known consumer, what we're really doing is we're thinking about pretty much anything we're testing for. And everything else out there is unknown. So when we started out in doing web development in Drupal and web development in general, we were thinking about desktops. We were thinking about different browser compatibilities. And that was the, the extent of the problems that we had to deal with. And then over the years, we've ended up in a place where We've now got to think about mobiles and think about tablets and different form factors and this sort of thing, as well as, of course, different browsers, although the different browser situation is now not as big a deal as it used to be. So what we can assume then is that if we're going out and thinking about a project, we're going to be thinking about aiming at these multiple, f form multiple formats, whether it be desktop, tablet, mobile, super wide desktop or whatever. But everything else out there is what I'm talking about as the unknown, unknown consumer. These are the things that are out there that can consume the content of your website that you didn't think about, that you didn't plan for. Oh, it does come out, okay. And what we've heard about, of course, is this internet of things. So you're here, everyone's heard this phrase now, it's very much what's going on in, in the press at the moment. Well, what we're seeing is that the Internet of Things, when it comes to the press at least, and the, and the modern, the, the popular perception, is that you've got these headline devices. You've got smart refrigerators, these things that uh, know what's in your fridge and can make an order direct with a supermarket to restock your fridge. This is the things that have caught the, the imagination of the public. And we've got these other household domestic appliances that we're thinking about um, whether it be the hive, you know, these types of domestic appliances that can also connect to the internet now. And really what we're talking about today is what are, what are we doing with these devices? But then we've got a whole other sector of devices. That white doesn't come out very well. But this is an example um, of a billboard that was run a couple of years ago by British Airways. So what's happening here in this advert, it's controlled by a number of beacons that are detecting the flights flying over in uh, Spigadilly Circus. And what you can see here is it's able to understand what flight just flew over, brings up the ID of that flight, the flight number, and where it's going, and spinning up on the billboard. Now this is a couple of years ago, this is an award-winning ad. But this is exactly the sort of stuff that we're thinking about now, and that's going to face us in the future. Where does the data from this billboard come from? This content management system. 
And then we've got this whole other realm of devices. We've got environmental monitoring, uh, infrastructure management, manufacturing, so big in factories, that sort of thing. Uh, energy management, smart meters are now becoming a big thing. There's a big campaign, at least where I live, to replace every meter in every household with a smart meter in the next two years. And then we've got medical devices and healthcare. Pretty much anything that can be connected to the internet in some way is, is being connected. Um, I won't even go into the examples that were coming up in the office yesterday. I mean, just stuff, crazy stuff. And then we've got the stuff that's also beyond the headlines, which people know about and people are aware of, but they don't really make the connection uh, to, to the content. So we've got the, the consumer devices, the wearable devices, the quantified self. So quantified self is things like your Fitbit, anything that's go gathering data about you. And then we've got this concept of smart retail, where you have devices like uh, beacons in shops that can actually tell what you're looking at, what shelf you're looking at, which pair of shoes you've just picked up, and also the, uh, you know, with, a, with the use of an app can actually give you a different retail experience. And this is already happening, and we're going to see much, much more of it. But the key is, in our context anyway, how many of these are actually content consumers? So we can eliminate a big uh, swath of those devices because they're not really content consuming devices. Uh, some of them are, are data devices, the, you know, your Fitbit, you're not going to read the news on your Fitbit or anything like that, or at least not yet. Um, so we can eliminate some of them. But there are some other examples. And again, these are examples that we know of through case studies that are out there. So Vodafone uh, have a kiosk system in store, and we know that it used to be controlled by someone going around to each kiosk and sticking the DVD in and updating the content. But that system has been replaced by a Drupal system that has all the content separate from the stores. And so that whenever there's a content update to be made, which of course is, a, is quite often, that content is pushed out to all of those stores via a content management system. So these are the things that, whilst not immediately obvious, are the types of things that we're seeing happening now. So even if you get cash out of a cash machine now, there's adverts in front of you, there's content in front of you. Every single place that you see a screen, there's content being pushed at you. And this is the future that we have to be ready for. This one is probably one of the most obvious ones. So Amazon Echo, Google Home, um, whilst we, we saw with, uh, this has been coming for a number of years with, with Siri as one of the, pre, the, the early ones, but Siri wasn't really open, it wasn't accessible. And it's only when Alexa and the Amazon Echo has come along with a very, very open API, allowing the likes of us to just hack away and, and build something. And it's amazing to see like, how many of our uh, Drupal shops and stuff around us are all having these little uh, Amazon Echo hackathons going on. Um, because it's actually quite easy to develop an Amazon Echo skill that, that can deliver content. And again, you know, there are Drupal modules that can connect to the Echo, and it makes it the perfect platform, really, for, for developing this kind of stuff. But it has to get content from somewhere. <coughs> so we're going to look a little, little bit further ahead now. Some of the things that are either happening right now, or maybe are not that far away from us. Again, theoretical, don't get excited. But anyway, this one, uh, FIFA 17. Football game, if you're into football, I'm not really, but I understand the concept. So, FIFA 17, there's an idea of player rankings within the game that determines the AI, how, how well they play, that sort of thing. Immediately this was launched, there's news stories like, oh, these rankings are, are wrong. Because this data goes out of date really quickly, or it's, maybe it's wrong, or maybe someone's opinion isn't the right opinion. So what about if we could connect together the actual source of the data with the game. <coughs> what if we could expose someone like a premiership team? What if we could expose their content to the game? And what if we get to a situation where, for example, uh, I'm watching a match on a Saturday afternoon, a player is injured, I pick the game up in the evening, the game knows that that player was injured and doesn't let me play with that player in the squad. What about if we got to that place where 
content and other consuming devices can actually do that sort of thing. And this doesn't seem that far-fetched to me. And this is, again, what we're talking about with different ways of consuming content that's not a web page, it's not a phone, it's not a tablet. This is another example. This is the website of the uh, FDA, the US Food and Drug Administration. We have the equivalent in the UK. But every medical device out there has the potential to be recalled for whatever reason. If it's found to be a fault in a batch or it's just found to be dangerous. The only way to know if, say I work in a hospital, say I'm a paramedic, I've got this device in an ambulance. How is the FDA going to get hold of me to tell me to take that device out of service? It's going to happen via the procurement department of the hospital, probably a big complicated flow of communication before it actually gets to the end user that says, don't use that device. So what if these types of medical devices could directly communicate with our content? What if our, direct, our devices could check for themselves whether they've been recalled? And what if in a rather extreme scenario, they could turn themselves off, and deactivate themselves? I'm sure there's a few ethical arguments about that. But ultimately, what if these kinds of devices can actually talk to our content and, and act on that data. <clears throat> so, this one. This is a concept from Mercedes. We've been hearing about the autonomous car that's going to be upon us within the next 10 years, if not sooner. And the fact is that once you've got a self-driving car, you don't even have to be facing the right way. Once they've properly got it right and you don't have to take over, so what about if this device has different screens inside it? Again, these are form factors we're not used to. We're not used to serving these form factors. We're not used to having this type of content consumption going on. So these are the things we have to be ready for now. And there's too many of these things. There's, no, there's so many. I've given you three examples. And the fact is, we, we, can't be, we can't anticipate what all of these different consuming devices are going to be. And that's why we have to do what we do, which is focus on the data and how we present the data. And the reason for this is very much this one. Software isn't very good at interpreting meaning. No matter how much AI you plug into it, there's still room for error. Well, what we need to do is find a way to, to help that situation. So take an example here. So we've got the Google autonomous car and we've got a the route guide from the AA. Now, the route guide from the AA is very nice, laid out for a human to read. And do you know what? It probably could be, it probably could be read by uh, a computer to some degree of success. But it's not designed that way. It's designed for visual human consumption. So how we structure the data for machine recognition is a completely different thing. I'll take another example. Uh, this is the BBC, uh, BBC Good Food site, it's a recipe. And on the other, on the other side there, you've got a diet tracking app. So what you're seeing here is, again, the recipe presented in a way that's human readable, very pleasing on the eye, very easy to understand, great UX. But how does that diet app understand that content? It can't. It can make a guess, but it wouldn't be a very good one. So these are the things we need to think about in terms of structuring content. Structuring content in ways that means other devices can understand that content. So how do we support them? And this is, the, this is the crux of it. What do we do about this problem that's facing us? A small problem now is going to be a big problem in the future. Now, we've already moved slightly away from this model. And this is the education process we have to go through. The, the web is not about pages anymore. But a lot of people do still think about the page model. Now, in the last few years, we've invented this semantic markup, semantic elements, and that makes things make a little bit more sense. I can define where the header is, where the navigation is, what's the main content, what's the side content, and so on. But really, this is only sort of signaling. This is only signaling to the devices which bits of the content are important. So what we need to do instead is we need to move beyond this sort of page-centric thinking into a place where you're thinking about the content model rather than about things as pages. 
And so our essential ingredients for doing this sort of thing, first of all, is a content modeling system and a, a way of structuring content properly and, of course, a way of getting this data out there. Funnily enough, both things that Drupal and Pixel Drupal 8 excels at. But there are some challenges to this. If we take this kind of approach, then what we've really got to do is tell the content creators that they're not in charge of the design anymore. Every time you give someone a WYSIWYG, there's temptation to, to add some design to it. So the biggest challenge here is to step back from that and help, to content, help content creators understand that what they're creating is content not for a web page, but for multiple, a multitude of uses. And there's huge online debates that have been raging for years on this, so I'm not going to go into them, but I will reference some of them. So the blobs versus chunks debate, this is a great one. Sometimes known as the battle of the body field, um, which I think Eaton's one of the sort of prime movers on. And again, this is a couple of years ago, but it's still going on. There's still a debate about should you give people a WYSIWYG? The moment you give someone a WYSIWYG, they start trying to do layout. We don't want them to do layout, so should we just not do that at all? So the battle for the body field, I encourage you to Google that one, and you'll get some great content on that. The second argument that goes along with this is the adaptive versus responsive design argument. Now again, Karen McCrane is, is one of the key advocates of this one, and it goes, along, it goes back a long way. And the, the, the main thrust of this one is that do we deliver the same content to every device, regardless of its capabilities? Or do we change what we send to the device, knowing that it can only consume this? Now, the original argument is we should always send the same content, and we should let the device decide for itself what it wants to do with it. That's one side of the argument, um, without sort of, you know, server-side device sniffing and so on. We have to assume that we're always we're going to be fair and deliver the same content. So this argument becomes relevant again, much more so, in that if you're talking to an Amazon Echo, there's no point in sending a 20-page piece of content because it's going to want to read the top paragraph. So we have to think about how we structure our content and, and what we do with it. So the next question that comes to is, well, why would we want to do this? What, what's in it for us? It sounds like a lot of work. What's the point? So we have a number of business models here that come into play. The first one being the open data model. So open up your data in the most granular way possible, and people will use it. And people will use it in ways you don't even think about. So you take a really good example of that, someone like Strava, who all of that riding and running data that they've collected, you can extract that data and do whatever you want. You can remix it. You know, there's great apps that can put all that riding data onto a video, 3D video, which looks amazing. And they're not necessarily charging for that. So having everything wide open and making sure that your data can be consumed by as wide a, a variety of people as possible. Of course, you can have paid API access, so you can, you can make it so a chargeable model. You can remix our content for a fee, or even a slightly different one, being that you, know, you can actually pay per access to the API. So these are things that we can think about. And the other thing we can think about is, you know, if, we're, if we're a media publishing company or something like that, maybe we can add more value to our existing content by offering these different devices and different options. Maybe we can give our news feed to a service that can do something with it that's interesting, again, that's outside of our control. And this always made me think, when we were talking about this, maybe this concept of naked content, unstructured, well, it's very structured, sorry, but undesigned content, is this the way we get around the ad blocker? You know, we change the model, we do something different. So, okay, that's all very nice. But we are where we are. So how do we get there now? So this is where we get to a little bit more specific, a bit more practical. We need to have a structured content model, and those of us who have been working in Drupal have been doing that all along. Uh, and we need to expose the content using a documented API. Now, again, this has been possible via the services module in Drupal for a while, but with Drupal 8, this has become much more mainstream and much simpler to do. 
But the first thing is the, is the fundamentals. It's before you even get near Drupal. It's getting this content model right. And I want to give you another example, theoretical example again, of a news article. So traditionally, this is what we would do. You've got your headline, you've got your body text, and you've got an image. Fundamentally, that's it, right? You don't need to do much more than that. This one is taking an example of an article that belongs to a football team, as the referencing back to the example earlier. So, well, okay, it's an article about a football team, so it might relate to a specific team, or to a specific player, or to a specific match or fixture, and maybe that fixture is related to some highlights reels, or what, what happened the last time we played that team, or what about if there's commentary? Uh, okay, well, we need the results as well. Um, and maybe that fixture is part of a competition, FA Cup, say. So we want to see what the standings are in that competition. And what if the players in that team for that article, or if that article is about specific players, they might have their own series of content. They might have their statistics. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that very, very quickly builds away from that standard model of an article. So we get to this place where we have these lots of small pieces of discrete content that all interact with each other. And our process very much is to start thinking, forget the technology, think the content model through, how all these things can relate to each other. And then again, from what we're talking about today, how we can use those individual pieces. So for example, uh, player stats could be very finely, finely granular and could be used for all sorts of reasons. So in, <laughs> this one's a, it's, you know, loose, loosely theory, um, but since we've been doing Drupal 8 and we're all switching our heads to OOP, what I want us to do a little bit is very loosely pick this, some of these concepts up. Now, I say very loosely, I did this presentation to a, a business audience, not a technical audience, so I could get away with it. With you lot, I'm not sure I will. Anyway, we'll try. So what we're going to do is take some of the concepts of OOP um, and apply them to content modeling. So the actual objects, the classes, we're going to say are the same as the content types. And the code is in the form of methods. And then you have the single responsibility principle. So the basic thing about object-oriented programming is that a, an object does one thing, and that's the only thing it does, and it's single responsibility. So if you loosely map that over to the content model, your content type should be really, really simple. It should only do one thing. It shouldn't be ambiguous about what it does. And we don't want to assume that anything else about that content type is present. Also, within the content type, each field within the content type should be really, really clear uh, about its single, single purpose. So, from my trawling through history of Drupal in many, many projects, to become a bit more practical, I want to show you some anti-patterns that we see all the time, of being guilty of, I'm sure, And I'll give you my sort of top three. This is my first one. This is the one I really hate. The, the non-content content. And we see this one a lot. What this is, is when you have a content type that doesn't do anything, a content type that's only purpose for existing is to take you somewhere else, basically a link. Now, there's, we do end up in this situation from time to time. Um, but it's just really annoying. Because the moment you've got there, you've got these you know, you've got these little bits of content that make no sense on their own. Uh, they get picked up by Google. They don't really have a formatted page, and they have to put things in like the rabbit hole module and all these hacky things to stop it happening. But instead of that, what we need to do is think about view modes and how we have the same content viewed in different ways. So this is an example of a teaser. Uh, how's this going to work? Okay, a teaser. And the full screen, uh, the full article, which leads up to the full article here. So I'm just going to flip back a second. Instead of having a jump, have a teaser. It's pretty much the basics of this. There was no need for the jump to exist, because we can just show a short form version of the article. And that way, we've got our article completely uh, in one place with all of its content together. So that's number one. 
This is my other favorite. I refer to as the, the Godzilla content type, the monster content type. And what, what happens here, and this is very, very common in sites that have evolved over many years, you start off with a very clear content model, but then gradually more fields get added, um, things get hacked around a little bit, and it, and it certainly immediately violates this single responsibility uh, theory, and often it leads from uh, a team's reluctance to have multiple content types because they perceive that multiple content types makes a site more complicated. But in fact, by having one content type that can do many, many things, uh, you're actually making it more, content, more complicated that way. So instead of that, yeah, it's okay to have discrete, small content types. And we think about the relationships between those content types instead. And again, we think carefully about that single responsibility. So there's never any question about, okay, I'm coming to create some content on the site. I know exactly what I have to do. And the next one uh, is sort of related, and that's field ambiguity. And this is one where you've got multiple fields in your content type, but you're not quite sure what they do. Uh, the way they were named maybe isn't clear. Or maybe, even worse, they do different things depending on different scenarios. The moment you've gone into this area, you've got a loss of structure of your content type. It doesn't quite make sense anymore. Um, and then you're, you're in a bad place. So, instead, we do have to do this content modeling exercise up front with all content stakeholders, not just the techies. We make sure that the people who are actually creating the content are involved um, and every content stakeholder is involved. And of course, nice clear help text so you know exactly what it is that you're creating. Oh, I have got a fourth one. Another favorite. Uh, this is the using content for logic one. So again, you're, what you're doing here is you're creating fields within your content types that aren't really content. And you're doing it for reasons like, if I fill this one in, make the text, make the background color blue. And it happens all the time. But uh, if you think about, again, you're thinking about non-web page delivery, that field makes no sense whatsoever anymore. So we have to think about this, and we have to think about the right way to do it. Don't mix your layout with the content, and make sure the application theme layer is doing the intelligent stuff, because that's where it belongs. OK, so what do we do next? We need a CMS with a good content modeling tool set, which we have in Drupal 8, which is great. We need to start that education process, or at least continue that education process, so that people understand why we have structured content. We're not doing it because we're developers and we like things that way. We're doing it for specific reasons that we talked about earlier in the, in the session here. We need to split that content from the design. We need to make that separation happen. And in order to do that, we need to handle these creative objections. We need to help these editors and content creators have that creative freedom without actually being a designer. So taking away the WYSIWYG. And we need to spend a lot of time on the content model. In fact, much more time than you might think you need um, in order to get this, this stuff done. And what I see here is that by going through this process, I don't know about you, but every project I do or I get involved in seems to have a massive lump of migration work involved. And that might be bringing historic, you know, seven years worth of historic content across to a new format. If we take this approach, this content model approach, with an open API, then maybe we never have to do that piece again. Maybe we end up in a place where that content can live on, even if we change systems or we change our front end or other things come along that we don't even know about yet. So I say future-proof our content, but really we know we can't do that. So the best thing we can do instead is prepare prepare our content for the future. Uh, and that being you know, ensuring portability of content between systems now and in the future. So I think the underlying message for me is this one. It's just embracing the unknown, preparing for it now, but really importantly, creating a legacy. Um, there was a keynote, oh, I can't remember which conference, it might have been a DrupalCon, um, from, from the Internet Archive, about how much content has been lost 
you know, it, it used to be the problem we had was disc formats went in, came in and out of style. You know, mini discs were here for a, no time at all, and then they're gone. And now we can't read those devices. No one has anything to read them with. And it's the same with content. Because of the fast-moving pace of the web at the moment, we're in a place where we're going to have a 20-year period of content that just goes down the tube somewhere, and we'll never see it again. I've worked on projects where the decision has been made to, OK, let's just migrate the last two years of content and not worry about the stuff before. And once we go down that slippery slope, we're going to be, you know, have a gap in history of this really, really important content. Even though we're creating loads of it millions of times more than we ever did, I personally think it's really important that we're creating a legacy in our content and having a content management system with an exposed API that we can exchange, exchange the, the other pieces of is, is really key. So I think that's my time, and that's the end. So uh, I think I might have time for some questions if you have any. But thank you. You, you were talking about stakeholders, but your future consumers aren't represented as stakeholders at all. So, no. So they're not, have, and they're the future. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that what you ideally like is a canonical knowledge representation into which you could swap things. So you don't, every time, model your knowledge area. Yeah. But you take, but I'm not clear that that, where the world, if the world's going that way, if the academics no. are going that way. It's difficult to say. I mean, uh, in the end, anything we do, we're making big assumptions. And there's no real stakeholder today that understands what's going to be there in five years' time. There, there's lots of speculation, but no one really predicted the uh, Amazon Echo properly. Um, no one really knows what impact the autonomous vehicles are going to have. They're going to have a massive cultural impact on us. Um, and maybe the, the sort of bit I'm talking about is probably very marginal. Um, yeah, but I think we can probably assume that, again, you know, iPads, tablets, and no one sort of, well, apart from maybe Star Trek, <laughs> predicted these things very well or what their impact would be. And we're very good at knowing, we're, we're very good at trying to figure out, based, extrapolating what we know now. What we're not very good at is when something completely different happens, which is pretty much every time. Um, and this is why, you know, when cars were, were invented, they were like horseless carriages. But people didn't really think, they think evolutionary to the next step, they don't think five steps ahead. And nor do we now, and we're still not really capable of it. So all I'm saying here is that we have to do the best we can right now with our model um, to make sure that we are prepared for these things that are going to suddenly jump out. Maybe we'll be the ones that are in some sort of place to benefit. So. Hi. Thanks. Um, just think about the canonical model of data. To what extent should we all be just using something like schema or and using that as our canonical reference versus doing our own modeling and thinking about how the world might look to our particular project? We should be saying, no, no, no. But in the same way you're taking away the WYSIWYG yep. from the editors because frankly they make poor choices, should you be taking away the content modeling from the content modelers and saying, no, no, let's use what is yeah, that's a really good point. Um, Schema.org does come into things, um, whether it covers every scenario. The, the trouble is with something like Schema.org is that it can back you into a, a preset shape, um, which is useful when you're, you know, for example, when you're sharing content out to Google or Amazon or wherever, then using those types of models is going to really assist you. Um, but when you're talking about something like the the example I gave earlier, there's not really a direct mapping to some schema at all. So it's a bit of both, really, I guess. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Hi. Um, I, uh, firstly, I think, I think your mapping of data database type structures to other things works fine. Okay, goes. <laughs> it's a bit loose. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's true, um, and I've not, uh, I've not tried to solve that as a specific problem. But 
in a way, by breaking the content into the really small elements, you, it's a real stretch to say you are having inheritance, but what you're doing is reusing pieces. Um, in, so, you know, fixtures, teams, players, that sort of stuff. Um, so we do find that there is an element of reuse and, and trying to move away from that gigantic content model or content type because everyone thought that was easier is that, that the, the content editor doesn't have to think they're just that I'm creating an article and then I'll fill all the bits in. I personally think it's much better that they know that they're creating a, an article or a, a press release or something else or something else. Um, that, uh, and then they're filling in the minimum they need to fill in and then making relationships with other bits of content is the way I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, it, and you know then that the moment you go to create your content, you're already prepared for, okay, this is going to take me an hour to get this one article out there or whatever it might be. And, and you probably don't remember what 40 of them do. Or, or <laughs> it's not just that, it's the way Facebook stores things, it's incredibly yeah. important to access it. So yes, true, true. I wouldn't say it's a, yeah, sorry, to repeat the question, um, the question was, yeah, if we're going to spit content from design, have we got any tips on how you actually achieve it? My question is similar. Yeah, sure, I'll answer both together, maybe. So, wait, my question is, well, how, how, how do you start? What's the starting point to um, sorry, um, how do you start to build the stakeholders? Do you need to mm -hmm. start with Yes. Yeah, so related question, which is about, you know, how do you, how do you educate stakeholders to the benefits of structured content? I give them this talk. I, I try and open their minds to this is the stuff that you're going to need to be ready for that is not in your spec. And, and if you don't think about this stuff now, your website has a life of a year, maybe two, and you'll be doing this again. And maybe that's what they want, in which case maybe this time I didn't win. But on the other hand, it's about... Yeah, as I say, opening, opening their minds past the spec they've got of I need to build this insurance website to does my insurance website need to give quotes over Alexa? And they may be, that might be in their roadmap way, way, way down the road, or it might not, and they just haven't connected it yet. They haven't connected the, oh, there's a team over there doing Alexa. Well, hang on, why aren't we talking to them? And they'll probably end up talking to each other six months down the road when it's too late to do anything about it. So our process really is, yeah, get in there early before um, we do a lot of discovery and uh, you know, that sort of stuff at the beginning of projects. It's very much getting this type of thing out there, um, helping them understand that there is a benefit. And that's the thing. There is a benefit to you not doing this. And actually, do you really want to do this? Are you really a designer? What are you really saying is, I want the image on the left or the image on the right. And we still end up building sites with things like paragraphs, which maybe isn't, uh, isn't fully in embracing this, um, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, I think part of the secondary sort of question is, for, for example, an administrative staff, they, they see a staff page, they want to change the bio of a person. Yep. 
we're telling them now that you don't get it that page. You go to somewhere you else. Find the, you yeah. find the field in the form. It yeah. updates. And they say, well, I, I don't know what that's going to look like. Yes. So it's on something else. That, and I don't, I mean. You don't, I mean, you don't go to Sainsbury's and choose your cereal and then go and pick up a test case. Yeah. <laughs> It's a difficult one, and and you have to. Yeah. Yeah, and and it is very much you have to sort of show them and show them that if you do, and, and currently we're building a project where it's 50 franchises around the world, but all the content is entered in one place and then beamed out. They never see it until it goes live. But we've had to go through that education process of saying, if you fill in the headline and the body in these fields, and here's your template of what it will look like, and it will work. Um, it's definitely a process. It's not a just accept it. You, you know, there is a, a lot of that. So I'm going to. There's another question at the back there. Sorry. Okay. Um, what's your view on content that disappears after 24 hours? Um, how do you tie that in with sort of your form and um, what you're thinking about? Because that is a way that people sort of consume content these days. So you dispose. So the question is, well, how do we deal with content that disappears after 24 hours? So Snapchat style disappearing yeah. images. Um, I mean, I don't really see there's much difference. I mean, uh, uh, the, the final few slides I had there was about the content legacy and, and how I strongly feel that we need to keep the content legacy. But actually, in the context of that kind of data, obviously there's no intention to keep it for long periods of time. But I don't see there's any difference. Um, Mm -hmm. How users actually consume, and how they. Um, so you're talking about the unknown consumer. Yeah. Um, maybe about um, how we're developers and how we're thinking about uh, you know, UX and new features on the site. Um, are there articles that disappear after 24 hours? Or yeah. Comments that disappear, or I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's very, very. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. I think, I think again, it doesn't change technically how we achieve it, um, but maybe you could extend the concept of the unknown consumer as the unknown consumer behavior. In that we never really thought that that was going to be a thing that people would want disposable content. Then when it came, it was obvious. So yeah, I think, I don't know whether I can really specifically answer the question, but certainly um, how you would do it and through the APIs and that sort of thing would make it perfectly possible to do it, even if you did keep it. Um, but yeah, it, trying to predict, be flexible enough to predict these different ways of behaving. And especially in media and publishing now, um, we've got all these different places that content can go, Apple News and Google and all those sort of things. So you know, again, not necessarily predicted, but we, using a system designed this way means we can pivot quickly into those new, new ways of consuming. So, uh, I think, can I do one more? One more? Mm -hmm. No, apparently not, sorry. Maybe you can chat to me afterwards. Thank you very much. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>